OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates, is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the social, political, and economic well being of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Based in Washington, D.C., with over 50 chapters around the country, we engage in issues like immigration, education, and fair treatment, among many others. We also provide resources and programs in order to build a pipeline of AAPI leaders so that our community can have a seat at every table. It's Keisha. OAC Greater Houston and I are going to be collaborating on this year's Lunar New Year. We're talking tarot, covering karma, and all things spiritual. If you want to book a session, check out our event bright page from February 12th to February 27th. I'll see you there. For the remainder of 2020, OCA Greater Houston's Citizenship Forums will be virtual. Please help us facilitate the process by filling out your application on Citizenship Works platform. Go online to citizenshipworks.org slash portal slash Houston and make sure to fill out all the information possible. If you have any questions, please email erica.chambers at ocahouston.org or call 281-968-9131 for the next steps. Make sure to fill out your application so you can join us online for the virtual visit. co-host for Starry Night Arts Fest in 2020. Yes, happy Lunar New Year and there's a wonderful way to support our artists, performers, and authors and today we have... Today we have The Most Beautiful Thing by Cal Kalia Yang. It's a children's book, an amazing children's book. Yes, and if you want to be the owner of this wonderful children's book, please participate in this raffle, watch this video, and if you weren't able to tune in to her reading and Q&A, please visit the website starrynightartsfest.com and all of the live streams, all the workshops, everything's still there. So please continue to support everyone. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. I'm one of the co-organizers for the Starry Night Arts Fest. And before, before we begin, uh, we, will, we would like to take a moment uh, for a land acknowledgement. We want to share that we are continuously learning and recognizing our own place in the history of colonization, I'm working to unlearn any actions or behaviors that may silence others or perpetuate systemic oppression. We want to take part and also encourage all of you to uplift and connect with the cultural legacies that existed and continue to exist today. Within the festival theme of giving, we mentioned we want to give space for unheard voices. This is our first step and honoring that throughout the festival. We acknowledge that we occupy stolen land. The lands that make up Texas are home to the Alabama Cushada tribe of Texas, the Kikapu traditional tribe of Texas, the Isleta del Sur Pueblo, the Laipan, Lipan, 
Apache tribe, and the Texas Band of Yaqui Indians. There are many more groups in Texas that are not mentioned, which means they are excluded from financial aid and resources. We acknowledge that many systemic erasure of these tribes and recognize they are still among us today. We acknowledge the peoples of these nations, their cultures, their communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the land and waters in which we stand upon. If not in Texas at the moment, you can find whose land you are occupying here at native-land .ca. Thank you so much for taking this moment with us. And I want to hand it over uh, to Trish. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone um, for being here. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of background music or music. Oh my God, sound. My nephews just came in. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit about OCA mission and vision. So OCA Greater Houston's mission and vision is to advance the social, political, economic well-being of the AAPI community. We do this in various programs. This year we launched our Asian Restaurant Weeks where we feature different AAPI local restaurant mom and pop shops, restaurant owners and chefs, and we were also part of the team that raised over $100,000 to feed frontline workers while also providing revenues for the restaurants. We also had our Happy Film Fest which is usually annual, but this was the first year that we did it virtual. And again, it was to promote the AAPI creatives in the film and entertainment industry. Uh, and throughout the year, uh, our amazing team worked with high school and college youth to support their leadership development. We had our amazing team that outreached to over 210,000 homes for the census and voting for different, in, in giving information in different languages. We also hosted our racial justice workshops where we used films to have deeper dialogue with our community and lastly you guys are here for our starry night arts festival thank you all so much normally this is in physical space um but this year we're doing it a little differently um and please for all of the uh oca houston programs just go to ocahouston.org to read more about it i'm gonna yeah, and, and, and again, Starry Night is to highlight and celebrate the diversity of AAPI artists, culture, and community, and to share the untold AAPI experience for the greater Houston metropolitan area through a shared AAPI community space. I'm going to hand it off to Ria now. Sure. I would love to introduce our facilitator for tonight. She is... Uh, absolutely wonderful, worked with us the entire Starry Night. We're just so happy to have her here. Um, we have Audrey Pan, is a current youth organizer and is working to grow the college affiliate program of OCA. She is also the Young Professionals Board of Chinatown Youth Initiative, whose power is to empower New York City youth with the knowledge and skills necessary to address the needs of Chinatown, Asian Americans, and other underrepresented communities. She grew up in New York City Chinatown, and has the daughter of and as a daughter of Chinese immigrants and former garment workers, she has always been a fierce advocate for fair and humane immigration policies and labor conditions. She holds a BA from Middlebury College in sociology with minors in education and Spanish and hopes to pursue community lawyering in the near future. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, traveling, and reading fiction in cafes. Without further ado, Audrey. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Ria, for that really, really warm welcome. Before I introduce our amazing, amazing speaker for tonight, I want to go over some housekeeping rules and also some community guidelines to ground us all for this conversation that we're going to embark on. Just um, for some housekeeping rules, if you can mute yourself um, before Q and, uh, until Q&A, that would be really great. Um, please also utilize the chat box. We love having an interactive audience. Um, I will be taking lots of notes. So if I see questions that come up, I will be jotting them down. And if I see a lot of similar questions, I'll also group them um, and hand those questions over to Kalia when it's time for Q&A. But if you also want to speak, we also welcome that as well. So feel free to raise your hand and that'll let us know on the tech side to unmute you and you can ask your question. 
In terms of community guidelines, we really want to cultivate a brave space, um, not only a safe space, but also a brave space to foster challenging dialogue. Um, there might be a lot of themes that are brought up tonight and a lot of that can also be very personally emotional. So we welcome that as well. Um, you know, what is said here stays here and what is learned here leaves here. Um, you know, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. We really want you all to take what you learn here tonight and share that with others. You know, that is the gift of knowledge and that is the gift of sharing. Step up and step down. Um, please, if you notice that you are speaking a lot, whether that is in, um, a verbal way or through chat, please allow others to step up um, and speak as well. Take care of yourself, you know, throughout this conversation, if you feel like you need to step back, you need to step out, whether that's just use the bathroom or to just get some air, please feel free to do so and you don't need to explain yourself um, at all. Practice engaged listening, to deeply listen to what other people are saying in this room tonight. Um, you can also take notes in your journal, as I will be. Um, respect different lived experience and perspectives, and when you are addressing the group, please speak with the I statement, um, knowing that you're talking about your own personal experience and not, and not that you're speaking for others or for an entire community. And with that, I am going to present our amazing guest for tonight, Kao Kalia Yang. Kao Kalia Yang is an award-winning Hmong American writer. She's the author of the memoirs, The Late Homecomer, which I have physically on me, a Hmong family memoir, The Song Poet, and Somewhere in the Unknown World. Yang is also the author of the children's books, A Map into the World, The Shared Room, and The Most Beautiful Thing, which she'll be reading to tonight. She co-edited the groundbreaking collection, What God is Honored Here, Writings on Miscarriage and Infant Loss by and for Indigenous Women and Women of Color, Yang's literary nonfiction has been recognized by the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Books Critics Circle Award, Ch the Chautauqua Prize, the Penn USA Literary Awards, the Dayton Literary Peace Pi Prize, and garnered three Minnesota Book Awards. Her children's books have been listed as an American Library Association Notable Book, a Zolo Tao Honor, a Kirkus Best Book of the Year, winner of a Minnesota Book Award in Children's Literature, and the Heartland Booksellers Award. Kalkalia Yang is a recipient of the McKnight Fellowship in Prose, the International Institute of Minnesota's Olga Zoltoy Award for her community leadership and service to new Americans, and the Ordway Center for the Performing Arts 2019 Sally Award for social impact. I also wanna add here that she's also an amazing, amazing TED speaker, um, TED Talk speaker, so please check out her TED Talk when you have the time. And with that, I will leave it to Kalia, Kalia to, to begin. Thank you, Audrey, for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. Um, thank you all for joining us. Debbie for recommending me, Rhea, Trisha, and Audrey. It's already been so inspiring for me just to be a part of this process. I am coming to all of you from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I am a writer, as, as we've just established. Um, but today is also my birthday, and I, I when, you know, when I was first invited, I thought this is the way I want to spend the first day of my 40th year on earth. And so I'm delighted to be here with all of you. We're going to start off by doing a reading from my, my newest children's book, and then we'll have a Q&A where I would invite all of you to engage with me. We're a small group, so I think we can have a wonderful, candid conversation. Um, with that, if we could queue up the video. The most beautiful thing. For the everlasting beauty of a grandmother's smile, for Zhuo Li, the grandma in this book, and Zhuo Ta, the grandma I never got to meet, but whose love shines through my mother. Kuo's dedication, for grandma who forgot everything, but will never be forgotten. The most beautiful thing by Kao Kalia Yang, illustrated by Kuo Lei. My grandmother is so old, no one knows how old she is. Not me, not my big sister, Da, not her older cousin, Lei. My father waits patiently when we try to guess her age. He is my grandma's ninth and youngest child, and even he does not know how old she is. 
We know that my grandma was born on the other side of the world, across a wide ocean. My grandma came from a time and a place where creatures lurked in the jungles, waiting to chase unwary children. She told us that she once looked into the gleaming eyes of a tiger and felt its hot breath on her face. By the time I was born, my grandmother already had an old woman's face. Her skin was soft but dry like paper, and in her mouth was a single tooth. Grandma said, it is the only thing standing strong in my mouth, this final tooth that my mother and father gave me. I asked to see a picture of her parents. She said, may I? They lived in a time long before the Hmong learned of such things as photographs. She pointed to her heart. The only picture I have of them is here. The luckiest of the grandchildren got to help take care of grandma. Lei got to wash grandma's clothes by hand at the bathroom sink with sweet smelling pink soap. Doug got to wash grandma's soft brown back in the bathtub with a soapy cloth. And me? I got to clip her fingernails and toenails while grandma sat on her favorite stool and the light from the window. I can still feel the roughness of grandma's heels in my hand the thickness of her toenails in between my fingers. I can see the bottoms of her feet, thick and brown and broken, deep cracks filled with the dirt from long ago and far away. Grandma told me that her mother and father died when she was a little girl. Grandma was just a child herself, but she had to take care of her two younger brothers and baby sister. I looked up at my grandma from the place where I sat at her feet, and I asked her, how did you get food for them? Grandma said, I didn't find enough food. We lived always with hunger eating us on the inside. All of my life with her, even with just her one tooth, grandma never said no when we offered her something to eat. The ice cream truck was singing its song from down the street. I looked underneath the couch for quarters. There were none. So I got ice cubes from the freezer. I offered one to grandma in my red plastic cup. She smiled at me. When I wanted a new dress to wear on the first day of third grade, my mother said she did not have enough money. She found some nickels and a dime in her purse and offered them to me. I bought hard peppermint candies from the neighborhood grocery at the corner of our block. When I got home, I offered one to Grandma on the palm of my hand. She smiled at me. At the round table with its shaky legs, I used my spoon to mix and mix in the center soup bowl we all shared. There were no pieces of meat, only bones and soft greens. My father said, the price of meat is too expensive at the market, may I? I found a thick chunk of bone and offered it to Grandma on my spoon. She smiled at me. We had plenty of meat only when we celebrated Hmong New Year with our aunts, uncles, and cousins. The old table was heavy with whole boiled chickens, more than our family could ever eat. After dinner, our bellies full, my cousins and I sat on the carpet around Grandma as she told us stories. She always began, it was a long time ago and I was just a girl. As we listened, our eyes grew round. Grandma twisted her fingers one over the other to show us what the hands of one's own jungle spirits the size of children looked like. She taught us how to listen for the cries of the fearsome Pinu by, by holding our breath until our hearts pounded in our ears. We were always sad when Anchu called, time for the children to help clean up. On a cold day, when the snow blew onto the window panes and the light was dim, I asked Grandma about the dirt in her feet. She told me she didn't have shoes after her mother and father died. She went shoeless to the mountains to tend to the family field. She ventured into the jungle to look for wild roots, bamboo shoots, and edible mushrooms. And one day, she was chased by a tiger. As she fled, her bare feet broke open on the fallen branches, and she still ran, blood and dirt mixing into clay with each step. 
I squeeze her feet in my arms and pull them close to my heart. A hug for the hard road she's walked to get to me. Each year cutting my grandma's nails went faster because I grew stronger and bigger and more able. Each year grandma's feet felt smaller and smaller in my hands and my lap. Her stories too slowed with the passing years. The pauses between her words grew long. Sometimes, as grandma was looking for the words she lost to the years, I grew distracted from my task, looking at the toys on the floor that needed to be picked up, the unfinished schoolwork, the younger children who needed to be bathed. Her deep, even breathing would call me back to the moment, only to find her eyes closed in sleep, one hand raised against the window to cradle her head. I grew unhappy with our life. I was tired of getting ice cubes from the freezer when I wanted ice cream. I was tired of never getting the new dress for that first day of school. I was tired of gnawing on the bone in the soup when I wanted meat for myself and my grandma. One evening, I studied my face in the bathroom mirror, wishing my teeth were straight. I came out of the bathroom and said, Mom and Dad, I want braces. Can I have them? My mother looked up from nursing my baby sister and said, we don't have any money, maybe next year. My father looked up from my toddler sister who was bouncing on his legs and said, I wish we could get you braces, may I? But we can't right now. My grandmother looked up from her special stool by the big window. Galia, she said, look at me. I turned to her in the glow of early evening. The sun was low in the sky, and its golden light fell on her face. Grandma asked, is my smile not beautiful? In that moment, I could see all the times my grandmother had smiled at me. I could taste the cold ice cubes that melted summer's heat from our tongues, the sweetness of the hard peppermint candies, and the deep flavors of the bone broth in the bowls of boiled greens. Even now, I can still see my grandma's single tooth, white against the shadows, standing tall in her open mouth. Her smile was the most beautiful thing. Thank you. You know, I have um, fond memories of uh, the library as a child. I remember when I got my first library card, my family were new to America. We came when I was six and a half from the refugee camps of Thailand. In the place where I came from, Hmong people couldn't leave. There was 400 acres, there was 40, 50,000 of us waiting for a place, a home somewhere in the world. In the place where I was born, suicide was the number one cause of death. My mother had six miscarriages after me because she chose to feed the children, the two girls in front of her. Not all of the little boys would come down from the sky in her belly to join us in life. And so my mother had six miscarriages after me. And often it was scary because I saw all around me what happened when Hmong people left the camp to forage for food because three days out of the week is not a whole week. And I remember men and women, girls and boys beaten, flood, I remember hair falling before faces. And I remember the heartbeat, listening to the heartbeat of all of the people who loved me, afraid, yearning to be somewhere else. And each time I asked for a story, all the adults in my life would tell me stories. My grandma would tell me stories of her past through her stories. Just like the cover of this book, I got to meet the little girl that she was. I got the privilege and the opportunity to learn about all the things that she had survived to come to me. And in doing so, I found strength for the work that I needed to do to get beyond that place underneath the hot sun. In America, when I got my first library card, I was so very happy because I'd never gone to school. And I, I loved stories because it was the only gift that anybody had to give me as a child. 
but I remember running to my grandma and presenting my purple St. Paul Public Library card. And I remember grandma asking, what is that? And I told her it was my license. It was gonna let me check out any story at all that I wanted to read from the library of a bigger world. And my grandma patted my hair with the long gesture of love. And then she said to me, are there stories like mine in it? And I've spent most of my childhood and all of my adult life searching for the stories like my grandmother's on the shelves of a bigger world. They were not to be found. And so in many ways, I became a writer to put the stories like my grandmother's, to put her story on those bookshelves. You know, the only thing I've ever done professionally in my life, earnestly, passionately, persistently, is to pursue a life in writing. I'm 40 years old today. I began when I was just 22. Now, after four books for adults and three books for children and more coming forth, I feel more and more the strength of my grandmother's stories inside of me and around me in the world when I am lonely and when I'm lost. Which is why it was such a joy for me when I got this invitation to come, you know, to be a part of the Starry Night Fest to share these stories with you. Because although Houston is far away from St. Paul, we are not far away from each other. As Asian Americans, for many of us as women, and for all of us, in so many ways, still as newcomers to this country that is still yet learning about whether or not we're deserving of the citizenship that we have all earned in so many ways. So please, I know Audrey has some questions unprepared, um, but I'm here for all of you. And so I welcome your feedback and your question and our time together. Thank you. Thank you, Clea, for that beautiful, beautiful reading. I think when I had read your, your children's book um, and now your novel for the first time, I think it's, it's always such a different experience, right? Hearing the writer themselves read it to you. Um, that's why I'm trying to like catch my breath right now. I feel, I, I feel my tears coming up. Um, yes, thank you so much for that beautiful reading. You're receiving a lot of love in the chat right now. And again, I will be um, opening up to Q&A. So if you have questions um, throughout any of, this, any of this evening, please feel free to put in the chat um, or raise your hand to unmute yourself. Um, but I, yes, I wanted to begin by one, thanking you. And then second, saying that, you know, someone who is not Hmong or Hmong American, there is something very nostalgic and reminiscent about this story. Um, and I think what is beautiful about your writing is that not only are we learning about the Hmong community, but myself personally, I was reflecting a lot about my own life growing up. And I was thinking a lot about my grandma. Um, and very similarly, I grew up having my, mom, my grandma take, taking care of me because my parents were always out working. And so she was my caretaker. Um, and she was also the person I always turned to whenever like my parents scolded me and specifically my mom. Whenever she scolded me, I would always run to grandma and be like, can you believe mom did this? And grandma was always on my side. Um, so this story for me is, is very beautiful in that sense that it's bringing up a lot of like fond memories for me. Um, I also wanna point out the beautiful illustrations in the book. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that later as well, Kalia. Cause um, personally for me, I didn't grow up reading children's books with people who looked like me, right? I didn't grow up reading children's books with um, stories that related to me on a personal level. Um, I remember growing up reading Amelia Bedelia in, yeah. in like elementary school you know, some, a white maid who, like, could never do anything right, um, and I could never relate to it whenever my teachers would ask questions to me, like, oh, do you have an Amelia Bedelia in your life, and I would always say, no, like, my mom, my mom could do anything, she could figure anything out, so I do not have this person in my life, um, and I know that you have worked on other works before, like memoirs, and also short essays, but again, we want to focus this talk on this book. And I actually would love to just begin by asking you what inspired you to write a children's book? 
you know, after the success of your award-winning memoir, the latecomer, the latecomer, and also the song poet, why and how did you decide to go into the genre of writing children's books? I think for the very same reason that that I think brings us together tonight, Audrey. Growing up here in Minnesota, um, I couldn't find any books that were reflective. I grew up reading Little House on the Prairie. You know, um, those are the books that and Roald Dahl, all of these white author books about worlds far away from mine. Um, when I became a writer, I knew, I knew certain things. I couldn't begin in children's literature. In order to establish myself as somebody who could write, I had to show that I could write for adults. You know, even after my first books came out, even after the awards, people would come up to me after my talks and they'd say, you speak English so well. You know, they'd say, what you, you know, who you are and what you said was not what we expected. You're surprised. I came here to learn more about the Hmong experience, but here I am learning about myself. And I would always have to remind people that unless you're a native, so many of us came from somewhere else to call this place home. I would have to remind people delicately um, that it wasn't so many generations ago that the people in their lives spoke with accents not so differently than my mother and my father's. I grew tired of reminding people of these things. You know, I said I, I started my journey into writing at the age of 22. By 27, my first book had come out. Um, but, but the conversations were always the same. No matter what stage I took, no matter who I was there beside, people were interested in, in these facets of me that wouldn't allow me to grow. And so I knew that I needed to diversify it. And I knew finally after my third book that I was ready to publish a children's book. Because I, by then I'd already become a mother. I had a little girl, I had two little boys, and we were reading to them all the time. But we were finding, you know, if we were lucky, African American books, other Asian American books, um, but no Hmong American books. And so at a public library event, a very moving event, because the bookmobile lady who had come to the housing projects when I was a child, she was in the room. She who I had once asked, you know, if there were books about people that looked like me. And she found a book by a Chinese American author and another about by a Japanese American author, but she could not find any books of Hmong people. And so she told me, sweetheart, they don't exist on these shelves. And this lady remembers, and I remember faintly whispering to her, someday a little girl's gonna come in here and she's gonna find a book about the people who love her most on these shelves. And so three years ago, almost exactly, I said out loud, I'm gonna write a children's book. And afterwards, she came up to me and she says, you haven't changed very much. And she, who I remember as towering and tall, she was probably five feet tall. I'm like four or 10, so she's still taller than me, but not by very much. She looks down at me and there are tears in her eyes and she said, it's about time. So I came back determined to write my first children's book. And as fate would have it, there were two people in that room and they had friends who were editors and they told their friends that Kao Kulia Yang wanted to write children's books. And so I checked my email the next day and there were two emails saying, we hear that you're interested in children's books. What do you have in mind? And so then began my tutorial in the children's book format, which is so very different from adult. The children's book only has under 32 pages. So the whole of the story has to happen in that space. You know, with every page turns, turn. Um, there is advancement in the story. There are all of these things that I had to learn. And thankfully, those two editors gave me a wonderful education. One of them ended up not wanting to publish me because she said I was too quiet, that children needed and wanted loud books, and that I was too quiet of a writer. I wouldn't be able to, to penetrate into the world of children's literature. But the other understood that there were quiet children too all over this country and that even loud children need quiet moments in their lives. And so my first book came out. And then my second book, The Shared Room, it needed to come out, not because I wanted to write it, Audrey, and I think this is so important to the story that I'm sharing today, 
Quale, my illustrator for The Most Beautiful Thing, is a Vietnamese, American art, a Vietnamese artist from Vietnam. She illustrated this book knowing that she would never qualify for the big prizes such as the Caldecott, which only uh, award and, and honor the work of American artists. So Qua knew that she would, her illustrations, no matter how beautiful they were, that they would never, never um, garner any, any of the big prizes in the land. And yes, she, she did it. And I knew she was the right artist because she understood Hmong tapestry, Hmong embroidery. She knew the Hmong of Vietnam. And I wanted her to bring everything she was to the page, just as I had brought everything I was. And that there was the beauty of the collaboration. But also I have to say this, because this is so true of my work, Children's book allowed me the opportunity to open the doorways for so many more Hmong American artists. You know, up until the shared room, there were no Hmong American artists in literary America. And so I looked hard to find C. Ryder, the illustrator of my second children's book. And it was so important for me that she was a Hmong American author because that was going to be a Hmong American book about a Hmong American family. In fact, it was inspired by a six year old girl that drowned in the Twin Cities. A little girl called Jenna, rain watcher, who told me at a reading that when she grew up, she wanted to be a writer. And when I asked her, what kind of writer do you want to be? She looked at me, she pointed her finger, and she said, the kind you are. So three years ago, I found out she drowned, and my heart broke. I went to her funeral, and I saw how her father could wrap his arms around the entirety of the casket. I wanted to give a book to her brothers and sisters, children grieving the loss of other children. There were none in the landscape of America. There were none that featured Asian Americans. And so with the blessing of her parents, um, I wrote the shared room about familial grief, communal grief, and how, and how hush and how quiet and how isolating and how lonely that experience can be for children. I have other children's books coming out and they feature, you know, a, a lot of Asian American, all Asian American um, illustrators, once again, because we need representation. It's not a want, it is a need. And as somebody who spent her whole professional life in this field, I'm now in a position where I can bring in new voices, new talent. And so children's books allow me not only to put the stories that I want in the world for, for children like my kids, they allow me to make space and room in a very, very tight field for creatives because I know they exist. And I know it is time for America to also know they exist. And so in many ways, it is a work of activism. In many ways, it is, continues to be a work of love. Every single book I've written, no matter who it is for and what it is about, it is an act of love from my community and for the life that we live here in America. And that is sometimes hard for white Americans to see, uh, but that hardness, it teaches me who and what I wanna be yet again, every single day as a writer. My grandmother, who was a very wise woman, um, she said to me, build your life because of your faith, not because of your fears. And those words guide me every single day. Did I answer your question, Audrey? Yes, always so beautifully and poetic. Um, Kalia, I noticed in a lot of your, in your, in your writings that you touch upon very heavy topics, um, you know, trauma, death, war, intergenerational trauma, um, migration. And what's been fascinating to see from your transition from memoirs into children's writing is that you also don't shy away from those topics when you're in your children's books. Um, and oftentimes, right, in children's books, we're almost trying to, we're always constantly as adults trying to protect the innocence of children. Um, and oftentimes in, in the children publishing world, we're trying to protect the innocence of white children. Um, can you speak a little bit about you know, what your thought process is like when you are writing to children, um, for whom are you writing for, and why you don't shy away from these very um, heavy topics? Such an important question, and I think the only way to answer truthfully and holistically is to begin with the way I was raised. I was raised by refugee parents who had very little power. You know, my mom and my dad, even in America, 
um, had very little ability to protect me from the world that we lived in. They worked during the night so that we could go to school during the day. At night, my older sister and I, even when we were young, took care of the younger ones. We knew that the things we were doing to stay whole as a family were illegal. We couldn't tell our teachers, you know? Growing up, my mom had WIC vouchers because they didn't earn enough to buy milk and to buy other things for us at the grocery store. And when, you, when you're a short Asian woman and you have WIC vouchers and you have, you know, milk on the, you have milk and government cheese and all this stuff, lots of cereal, you know, everybody behind you is impatient. Everybody behind you stares, you know, and my mother would, would stand in those lines often with me or my older sister beside her and we would try to look brave. We knew we were being judged but we tried to look dignified. You know, Christmas was always toys for tots. Mom and dad never had money to buy us gifts. So every Christmas day, my mother would disappear. By evening, she would be back with, a, with, a, with like a bag full of stuffed animals or a few coloring books for us so that we could say that we had, we had received something for Christmas, an American holiday. Thanksgiving was Meals on Wheels. You never got a whole turkey. You got a few slices of turkey breast. I still remember being third grade and the teacher saying, draw your Thanksgiving turkey. And I drew mine. And it was a few slices of turkey breast and everybody laughed. I still have very clear memories of that. I was raised by the truth of our lives. And I am, I think, a decent human being. I think that I have built, as my father had wished, a heart that every year understands more firmly, not of its fragility, but of its tremendous strength. And in many ways, this is exactly the way I want to raise my children. You know, I live on the east side of St. Paul, one of the most impoverished and diverse parts of the city, the very part of the city that raised me. When I was a kid, I used to dream of a day when I would get a college education and maybe a graduate degree when I would earn enough money to move my family away from the, you know, the brown sandwich bags that carry bottles inside. I wanted to move away from the syringes. I wanted to go somewhere nice. But I found as an adult that the very same neighborhood that raised me were full of nice people, nice families, just like mine. And so I returned here to raise my children. This is why I write about the kind of stuff I write about. Children are not immune to the problems of our world. In fact, for so many families, families of color, native families, poor families, children are oftentimes isolated because of these truths that we cannot communicate with them. And so I want to raise my children and the children who, who read my books with the truths of our lives because the reality is that there's tremendous beauty, there's tremendous love, there's tremendous emotion. And I don't, I don't want to be a fake writer in that regard. My interest is that I'm preserving um, white fragility, even for the young. As a children's book author, I understand I have a responsibility to, to, to create that fire, that ignite that fire that we hope will burn for a lifetime a love of literature, and understanding that the power of stories is that they can actually change human life for the better. Because of all of these things, because I honor the man and the woman who raised me, because in many ways I aspire to be like the woman who stood in those lines all of those years ago to make sure that I would have milk in my cup every day. I write the kinds of books I do shamelessly, without reservation. I stand by the truths of my life and my work. Thank you for that answer. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what it is that you want your audience members to walk away with? You know, is it, is it honoring the truths in their lives? Um, I, ask that, I ask that question because you know, not only do your children's books speak to children, I feel like they're also for families as well, for parents, for um, single home caretakers. Even as an adult, quote unquote, um, reading this book, I learned so much. And I feel like you are the kind of writer who wants to 
have their readers consistently go back to your work, right? Um, and I think whenever you're rereading something at a different age or a different stage in your life, you're going to take something differently away. So, you know, what are some lessons that you want children to walk away with? And what are some lessons that you want adults to walk away with from reading your books? I think one of the most important things to me personally, especially in light of 2020, the way we have lived where so many families have been so far apart, where so many families are having to make do with so very little. I mean, for me, the whole heart of this book is a simple reminder that the most beautiful things in life are the things that money cannot buy. It is our memories. It is the gift that we carry of each other's stories. You know, these are the most beautiful things in a life. And I think this is a necessary reminder uh, for all of us, no matter how old or how young we are. One of my favorite gifts to receive are actually children's books. And one of my favorite gifts to give are also children's books, in, in large part because the illustrations are so lovely. Um, and, and every book already feels like a gift, um, you know, but also I think because it is so elemental. Children's books are so elemental. Their function is to make us feel. When I was a kid, I really wanted to be normal. I really wanted to see what the insides of a movie theater look like, knowing that my mom and dad couldn't afford the admissions fee to get me inside one. I used to pretend that I knew what the insides of a movie theater looked like to be normal. It was this weight that I carried in my heart, this lie that I knew I was telling the world to be normal. But I remember my father looking at me one day and saying to me, do you know that it is everything that makes you different, that these things are your gifts to the world? I remember feeling so inadequate because I was so small and because I was so not smart, because there were so many things that I wanted and needed from myself that I didn't know how to give. You know, and so because my dad is a beautiful song poet in the Hmong tradition, um, he has this tape cassette by his bed where he used to record his songs. And whenever they came to him, he would press record. And I remember one night going into his room, I must have been 12, and I pressed record. And I told my mom and dad that I'm the biggest failure of their lives, that I'm too small to carry their dreams. And they don't know it, but I know the truth. I'm not smart enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not bold enough to deliver on the promise that they, the promise the promise of a better future for all of us. And then shortly after that, I forgot that I ever recorded that message, but my mom still has that tape. She played it for my younger brother. He's 17. Uh, it's, it's a long time that she's kept this tape, you know, but I remember several months after making that recording and my father um, walking into my room and again, sweeping my hair back from my, from my face, the moan gesture of love, except my father has spent most of his life in America as a machinist. So he has incredibly rough hands. When you use human flesh to cut into metal, human flesh suffers. And when he's, you know, every time he sweeps our hair back, it hurts because it tangles with hair. But, I, you know, I, I'm always so careful not to flinch, not to show him that, that, that it hurts. And my dad, he tells me, do you know that you're the very best thing I have? You're my only chance. No matter how good no matter how bad you turn out to be, you are my only chance, my best chance. Those words have channeled the heart of a writer. In America, it is harder to make a living in the arts than it is to become a professional athlete. I am who I am and I do what I do because I understand no matter how good, no matter how bad, it doesn't matter. I am their only chance. In some ways, because I was one of the first, I was my community's first chance into this literary life. And in all of my work, I go back to those moments that made my heart what it is, this space of possibilities, this, this engine of my dreams. At 40, I'm still chasing my dreams, still chasing them. Most 40 year olds know exactly, you know, where they're gonna be next year and the year after. No such guarantees in the artist's life. 
But that's what my children's book do for me, and I hope that that's what they do for my readers, no matter how young and no matter how old, that they remind each and every single one of us that it is our differences that we will give to the world, that regardless how good or bad we are, we are, our families, our ancestors, only chance. Kalia, you carry so many stories, you know, within you, you know, stories of your own and also stories from your family. Is that a lot to bear? Um, and can you talk about how you translate these stories that are inside of you onto paper? What is that writing process like? Um, oftentimes, there are some writers who say that they'll see, they'll see something and it'll remind them of a memory. And then that's when they begin to write. Um, what is that journey like for you as a writer? That is such a good question. You know, the word intersectionality has come into play, but I think it speaks profoundly to so many marginalized lives. You know, as a daughter and a, and a wife and a mother and an artist, you know, I am like the, um, my husband is a stay at home dad. And, you know, he is a white man with a PhD. As good of an education as money can buy in this country, um, it is it is an act of defiance in some ways, his choice to be a stay-at-home dad. But more than an act of defiance, it is a statement of his faith in me and the work I do and the way I move through, through, through the world. He wants to ensure that I can do the work that I, that I am destined in some sense to do. Um, this means that the stakes are always high, Audrey. When I go to the page, the page has to work. I give myself room on the page before I write every single time to upload all of the stuff of life, the daily demands and rituals of a life, you know, bathing the children, feeding them, all of the stuff. After the two hours, that's really when my writing shifts. And I know that I'm writing for a bigger audience in a bigger world. And I'm writing a space from beyond me. So in some sense, I will say this, I carry so many stories. I wouldn't be able to, to, to feel so gently and softly to, to live so calmly and coolly if I weren't a writer. Writing allows me, it is that function that allows me um, the space and room to breathe my heart out. You know, every time I speak, every time I write, I'm throwing my heart into the world, hoping and believing that there are people on the other end, people I cannot see, who are there waiting to catch it, who need it too. You know, it is that process that I, I go through every time. I don't know if it's only imagination. I will say this. When I was a young writer, when I was at Columbia University in New York City, there were many nights when I couldn't write because I was intimidated by the, I mean, the average age in the MFA program is 29. So I was 22, significantly younger than my cohort. And a lot of the, the people came from these Ivy League educations um, from certain different classes and so there were many many nights when I couldn't write and I used to go on these long walks around Columbia's campus and I find a seat somewhere and I would look up and you know if the lights in the physics department were on or the lights in the law school were on I would tell myself somebody in the physics department is looking for the cure to cancer somebody in the law school is going to open up the next human rights case and we're never going to see it the same way again but they are working by electricity light. Here I sit beneath the light of a bigger moon. If the moon can pull the ocean tides, why can't it pull the words out of me? And that was the imaginative possibility I had to give myself in order to write. And maybe that is still true here. You cannot break down a brick wall as a Southeast Asian writer, as, as a, a Hmong American writer from a, from a community that is new to, to what is written, because it wasn't until the 1950s that our French missionary devised a Roman script for the Hmong of Laos. You know, I've had to use my imagination to go into spaces and places where somebody like me has never been known. And so that is the heart of why I do what I do and how I do what I do. Every time I write, I open up a possibility that has yet to exist. And I enter through it where, and in that world, everything is possible. 
in that world my heart beats on every single line and every single story is an offering a gift a contribution thank you you know i was i've been reading um alongside your book right now i've been reading um a book by kathy parkong um, minor feelings. And, yes, minor feelings. And she talks about the publishing industry, right? It's still 76% white. Um, and although there have been more works from writers of color, oftentimes publishers are looking for a very particular story. They're looking for a story that fits into their white imagination. Um, they're looking for racial trauma. Um, how, can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to navigate in the publishing world? Um, and you know, what I love about your work is that it's very unapologetic. You're not, when I'm reading your work, it doesn't feel at all that you're writing for the white imagination. You're not writing to satisfy this white imaginary audience. It's, it feels very much like you're writing for yourself to heal. You're writing for your community, for your family. You're writing for those who have never had the chance to, to write. Um, and so what do you say to you know, young, young Asian American writers who want to get into the public industry, but they're too scared to truthfully tell their own stories? Such a good question. So pragmatically, I will say this. Minnesota has more grants for writers and creatives than any other state in the nation. So perhaps consider Minnesota, one of the most racist states in the nation on all racial equity measures, but they have this supply of funding for young writers, right? So, so that, is, that is important for me to say. And also very pragmatically, um, it's important to know that Minnesota is home to some of the finest independent presses in the country, perhaps in the world. You know, my journey into writing was very humble. I, I studied at Columbia. There were then agents courting me, but I knew that for the story of my life, I wanted to return to Minnesota to, to, to finish the book. By the time the book was done, those agents were no longer in place. That is the nature of the industry. And I was getting rejections that were pretty cruel. They're like, do Hmong people even read anyway? The Vietnam War is such a sad chapter in American history. Why do we want to revisit? Why would anybody want to revisit? Um, but I remember, and it was my, what, my 25th or 26th birthday, I, I Googled independent publishing presses. Coffee House Press came up first. Um, I went to their website and they said very loudly, we want to publish the underrepresented voices in literature. And I said, that's me. So I followed their submission protocol, a long uh, process that demanded a lot of patience and fortitude because they asked you for an outline, then they asked you for cha sample chapters, and then they eventually asked you for the whole manuscript. And that took months and months and months. Um, but that was how I started publishing. I was a grassroots writer from an independent house. You know, the book has exceeded all expectations of the press, but not my own. And I think that is really important for me to say. When you're, a, when you're first emerging, people want to know who you're writing for. I always said from the very beginning, I'm writing first for the people who would understand and then those who wouldn't. I refuse to box myself in, knowing that others had boxes already prepared for somebody like me. You know? Um, and then that, that was how I began. I was a selective mute, so I had to learn how to speak, how to speak in English publicly. In Hmong, it sounds like I'm singing a song every time I open my mouth. Hmong is a tonal language. Every breath I breathe carries meaning. English is not a tonal language. I'm continually and eternally breathless in the language. You know, and I say this because it feels like it. I have to sculpt the, the rocks in my throat to make sense to a bigger world every time, you know. But I became a public speaker to make my story real, Audrey. Educated people were reading and they were saying, how could this be true? How could Laos have been the most heavily bombed nation in the world if the world didn't know it? How could America have, have you know, commissioned 32,000 Hmong men, boys and girls to fight and to die on our behalf. How could I not have known? And so I had to speak to make the story real. And in the process, I became a public speaker. But I knew 
I knew all along the way that mine was a writer's heart and that I had to return to the page. Kathy is absolutely right. You know, books since 19, what, 1950, the New York Times just published 95% of all fictional work published in America since 1955 are by white writers. That's as far back as they went. If they went further back, the percentage would be even higher. But I think that is the reality of the world that we live in. Because of my particular journey, I didn't have a model in how to do this. So I knew I was establishing a model. You know, I've been working at this for a long time at I think the highest calibers of the game. And yet it's taken me this long to meet you all. You know, it was Debbie who heard me read first, who understood that perhaps Houston needed to hear me too and made the introductions. That is the journey of this writer's life. It is how I made it to, to, to Yale. It is how I made it to Columbia. It is how I made it all of my life, a person at a time. And that's just the truth, right? Without white privilege and the systemic things on my side. Right. And thank you for now giving us a model. Um, you know, we talk about representation all the time as if it's a choice, right? Representation matters. So thank you for, for sharing your narratives and also being so unapologetic with your stories. Um, I wanna take some questions from the audience. If not, I will keep going with all the questions that I have. I wrote like 50. <laughs> Please, don't be shy. Um, and if you are, feel free to utilize the chat box and I can read your question with your permission. I will mute myself and give you all some time to think. Hi, could I ask a question? Yes, okay. Kim. Please. First of all, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for um, reading to us and for all your eloquent answers. It sounds like you're writing a poem with every answer you give. So thank you so much. Like, I'm very, very touched. Um, I guess I want to ask, what advice would you have for young writers who don't, like, for me personally, I don't necessarily want to go into writing as a career, but I do write poetry on the side. I journal, like what advice would you have for writing in general? Such a good question. You know, writing is a muscle, like any other muscle in the body. The more you work it, the stronger it becomes. Um, the, for me, the hardest challenge when I was the first, uh, when I was a young writer was, I could begin a thousand beginnings. It was hard for me to find an ending for anything because I was contending with the issues of my real life and I didn't know how to solve them. So I didn't know how to solve them on the page. When I was younger, I used to kill off myself, you know, fictional, whatever it was, I used to kill off the protagonist, the end, then the story ended. Um, at some point I had to understand that writing was about reckoning. It wasn't about finding all of the answers to all of life, it was about the reckoning. I think the most important exercise for any emerging writer is to begin a story and to actually stick it through and write it to its end. That, that sense of completion would create a kind of momentum that will allow you to run the eventual marathons that you need to run in order to write um, satisfyingly. You know, I'll say this, every good writer is first and foremost our first readers. We are our first readers. You know, I have so many students who tell me, this is so boring, I can't even read it. And the truth is, if it's boring to you, chances are it's gonna be boring for me as well, right? And so when I write something, I'll write it through. And then when I read it, I look for emotional truth. I'm not looking for beautiful sentences. I'm not looking for, for structural, you know, experimental successes. I'm looking for emotional truth. When the writing speaks profoundly to me, I know that it stands a chance of speaking to my audience. Um, and in, in, that, in that way, the writing process is, is incredibly transparent. How much your work means to you is how much it's gonna to mean to your audience, especially when it's working effectively. At some point, you have to begin to show your work to, uh, to readers, to, uh, to, to a living audience. 
they don't have to say something. It is the way they read your manuscript. It is, it is the time they take. It is the look in their eyes, the look away from the page that will tell you whether your work is working or not. And, and I think that is how we grow as writers. We are made aware of our patterns. You know, I used to love semicolons and I used to have, I never knew it, but then everybody started circling them, like eight or nine on a page. You can hear it sometimes in the way I talk. I flow and flow and flow, and that structure was replicated on the page. Um, but the moment somebody circled in, I saw all those semicolons, I knew I had to edit myself, you know? And I became a, not only a writer and a reader, but an editor of my own work. And this is, I think, the journey to professionalism. Um, but I think in the beginning, the truth is just to write your truth. Get comfortable with your voice. The same is true in speaking, you know. If we, so many writers, they race through their words and we never really get to hear it. And that is because they never really get to hear themselves. So often when we go to the page, we're racing through. But we have to remind ourselves that whole page there exists and it's blank and exists for us. We can take as much time as we want. We can scribble as we need to. We can press as hard as we like. Or if you're doing it on a typewriter like me, let your fingers dance on the keys. Know that freedom of movement, because you deserve it. You deserve to know how fast you can go. You deserve to know when you get tired. You deserve to know when you need to stop. All of this is educational on the writer's journey. But more often than not, I think the hardest truths that we have to come to is the single fact. We deserve more than one chance. If the first thing doesn't work, we deserve to, uh, an opportunity to generate the second and the third and the fourth. That is the growing journey. If you don't give yourself an opportunity to grow, you will never grow on the page or off of it. Was that helpful? Yes, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you for your question. The floor is open. Please continue with the questions. I will pause again um, and let you all think. Um, I know for me, like, sometimes it takes a while to process. Um, and so please take your time to think of your question. And, you know, after a little bit, if there are no questions, I'll continue with mine. Um, hi, I have a question. Um, I'm curious about the process of choosing words or language when it comes to writing your children's books. I'm asking this from the perspective of like, I guess like a teacher or educator thinking about how you translate really complex ideas and emotions into something that can be accessible. And that can be different depending on who you're speaking with or sharing the story with, I guess. But like, yeah, what's that process like for you? And I imagine it would be difficult, especially if you have a lot of complexity going on in here and turning that into something simplistic and yet still still complex. So uh, yeah, what's that process like for you in translating thoughts to, to words? That's such a good question. Um... You know, so I'm bilingual and I speak a little bit of Thai and a little bit of Spanish, but I am completely fluent in Hmong and English. And the thing about being bilingual is that, and bicultural, is that you see how things are done from a uh, from, from many, here, let me tell, tell, let me explain in a story. You know, so we lived in a time in a place called Andover, Minnesota. Andover, Minnesota was very strict. They only let you water the grass at certain times. Um, my mom and dad one year got uh, cited for these tall, tall trees in our backyard. 
we needed to take them down or the city was going to come and take them down for us for a massive amount of money that we didn't have. My father had two ladders. They were both shorter ladders, not tall enough to get to the tops of the trees. But he had this idea. My dad said that he was going to set up one ladder against the base of a tree, carry one on his back. He was going to climb that ladder, untie the ladder from his back, tie it to the tree, and then climb up that tree. And then he would cut the branches down one by one by one. And I looked at my dad, who's this heavy, heavy set older man. And I told him, Dad, I think that's illegal. And my father says to me, if you're so worried about legalities, you go stand by the side of the road and tell me when the cops are coming. My brother-in-law looks at my dad and he says, Dad, if you're going to do that, let me go up because I'm younger. When I fall, my bones will heal faster. My dad said to him, if you intend to fall, you're not going up. And so we're all standing around. I'm standing by the side of the road, okay? This is a pretty white area and we're like the singular dark hair family. And our, my father's about to do this. So I'm standing by the side of the road looking out for the cops. And I see my dad walk, you know, tie a ladder to his back. He walks, he stacks up a ladder against the base of the tree, climbs up that ladder, undoes the one from his back, climbs up that, that tree, and cuts down the tree limbs one at a time. When he's done, I run to him because I'm truly impressed. And I say to my dad, Daddy, that's amazing. And he looks at me with this look of profound disappointment. And he says to me, the problem with the American education system is that it taught you that there were only that there was one way to do something right. If you had learned how to ask your teachers, is there another way to do this? Is there another way to think about it? If your teachers had learned how to ask you, is there another way to think about this? Is there another way to do this? You would have exploded the rooms of the classroom, the walls of the classroom, and you would have brought the world right in. That story stays with me. And particularly because as a writer, a writer is a writer because you can stop yourself mid-sentence and you see the different options and you choose one conscientiously and deliberately, right? I could end this, this sentence with an with exclamation point and make you yell a little with me. I can make it short and it'll feel like a punch. I can make it long, draw every single bit of breath from you until you're as breathless, until you have as much on the line as I do. There are all of these choices that a writer has. Knowing your options is what I think allows a writer to be in the end. And so for me, when I'm writing, I always make sure that my options are wide open, that I could do anything at a given time in a given sentence when I need to do it. In the world of children's literature, I, I, feel, I feel a responsibility to instill lines that will make my illustrators excited. I want to play with their imagination. So there's a manuscript that's coming out. It's called Cage from Coquila um, Press, one of the big New York houses. And there's a part where I'm writing about children playing in the, in, on the ground. And I say that the children are, are the, 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 they're, that they want to fly so they're drawing wings on the ground. And because they're drawing so fast and moving around each other, the dust rises, right? And all of a sudden they're, they're in flight. I'm tickling the imagination of a probable illustrator there. I am, I'm, I am in many ways fishing for one, but right? I'm fishing for an illustrator who will get excited about that image. And so the world of children's literature from an imagistic perspective, it has to be tantalizing always because we're teasing the words out of the, the, the images out of somebody's imagination. So that is one responsibility that I have and that is to the illustrator. And then I have a responsibility to the child's reader. And in that, in that part of it, I am writing in that way to the very best of myself. I'm writing to this, what, 60-year-old woman, my mom, who still, whenever she sits on a chair that's too high, she swings her legs, Michaela. My mom swings her legs. And I know that she's, swinging her, she's been swinging her legs for 60 years, right? maybe 59 years, because I can't imagine a time and a place when, when the regular chairs have ever fit, you know, have, have ever been made for a woman like my mom, you know? And so I have a responsibility to the illustrator, to the, my child reader, and then to the parents. I want my work to have integrity. I want the ideas on the page to be magical enough to test against the boundaries of reality. You know? In my very first book, I talked about how in the Bambi Nine refugee camp, my father used to take me to the tops of the trees because he, 
because he didn't because he wanted me to see a world beyond the fences and i remember being um in workshop and all of these white writers telling me that that couldn't be true well, what kind of refugee man would take their daughters up to the tops of trees it was too beautiful to be true to see a bigger world and i had to say i have a picture to prove it you know and that is why that picture exists in the late homecomer when you're reading through it you get to this one part and there's a picture of a man holding his child up on the tops of the trees sometimes a medium with the credibility of a white audience and i want to show them i want to show them how life is lived from where i'm positioned and so every time I'm writing a book, I'm always thinking about these things, but in particular for, for my children's books, um, these are some of the things that, that, that I think guide me on the page, being true to the collaborators who work with me creatively, to the child's reader, and to the, 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 the assumptions and presumptions of the parents. Um, they all come into play, but I always also think about the teachers in the classroom. I want books that are teachable. I want books that will be taught. And so that, that also um, informs the way I do the work I do. I have a writer friend who I love. She swears all the time. And whenever she, she goes to the school, she's just swearing. And all of the teachers and all of the adults are always kind of scared of her. But that's, that's her thing, you know, she loves swearing. I don't love swearing. And so when I swear, it doesn't sound natural, you know? But we, we are good friends because we're both so true to who we are. Understanding that children need to learn from the both of us, just as we all need to learn from every other human being in the world. I see that we have like uh, 12 minutes left. If anybody has another question, um, I would be happy to answer or else I could read you all out. I'll read you a little bit from my, from my newest ad book for adults, Somewhere in the Unknown World out. So I'll let you all decide. In the chat or, or with your hands, if you take a vote, I will see. One vote for reading. I'm gonna wait until there's like three vote. Two, three, four, five. Is five the majority? Yes, okay. So on November 10th, um, this book came out, Somewhere in the Unknown World. It is a collective refugee memoir. So once again, I'm pushing the form of the memoir, right? Memoir is traditionally um, for, for wealthy people, famous people who we know about that were interested in their memories. But my memoirs have never been about famous people. They've never been about wealthy people. Um, my first book was a family memoir. So already I was pushing the boundaries. This is a collective refugee memoir. So it's 14 different stories from around the world. So this is not only the Hmong story, this is, um, you know, there, there's a Cambodian man, a Vietnamese man, um, a Somali woman, and so many more all from all around the world. But it is a collective refugee memoir. This is the dedication. For the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children, whose fates have been told by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. And it starts out with a poem by my favorite American poet, Lucille Clifton. It's called Quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow-eyed woman sits with her daughter, quilting. Some other wear alchemists mumble over pots. Their chemistry stirs into science. Their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman threading together her need and her needle, nods toward the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does this poem end? Do the daughter's daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their tables? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? And I'm going to read from 
uh, from Awo's story. So Awo is um, Somali, and it is called The Strongest Love Story. I'm just going to read two parts from her story. I'm walking through fog. They're arguing, my mother and father. They don't do this often. This is not a normal occurrence in my life. She's telling him we have to leave for America, for our education, for the future. She's telling him that no price is too high to pay for our eventual success. He wants her to stay. He wants his children close. He is comfortable driving the distance, when possible, from Bunhudo to Alaska Nude. There is a future in Somalia. They have parents. Their parents have land and animals. The children can grow up and become good adults like us still. Their educations have not been interrupted. They will be fine. She will not hear any of it. Her voice is steel. It can cut. It will cut. It will make such a clean cut through my father's heart that he will not be able to feel it until we are gone. I'm staring at a wall. I see my mother and father on this day as characters in a mural. She's wearing black and he's wearing white. There is no setting, no sun, no moon, no other characters. Just the two of them on the white wall of my childhood. He is smaller. He is in the background. She looms large. She's beautiful and wise, and she stands so tall and elegantly, her head high, facing the blank future, unafraid. She tells him, I will come back one day. We will buy land, enough to build five houses. The children will live in those houses. We will be together in Bunhudo. He tells her, I am a man. I'm a husband. I'm a father. If you go away, if you take the children, what is left of me? She says, you are a doctor as you were when I met you. Your first duty is to take care of those in front of you. I'm a nurse. My duty is to assist you in your work to the best of my ability. His exhausted sigh, his defeated sigh, my father, just a man in white. His hands parted, palms open, a gesture always of welcome, of goodwill. He is a warrior fighting the good fight, not with a sword, but with a steadfast obedience to my mother's vision of the world. The fog grows thick and it grows thin as I grow up and I grow older. So Awo's mother leaves her father. It's 20 years after that leaving. And every Saturday, the family gathers around their mother's phone. They use the phone cards to call home. First, they call Boonhudo, then they call Laskanud. Every Saturday in those conversations, they become a full family, a mother, a father, and their children, voices celebrating their gratitude for each other's safety and small successes. Each is reminded of the immense love in their lives, a love that survives unimaginable distance. That's from somewhere in the unknown world. And I think that is so true. We, all of us in this room, we live in a love story that has survived unimaginable distances to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for organizing this. I truly leave this conversation and our time together inspired by the fortitude, the intelligence, but also the generosity of Rhea, Trish, all of you guys, Audrey, and Debbie, thank you again for having me as a guest. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, before we close out, um, I wanna thank you, Kalia, for your words, your stories, your voice. We need more voices like yours in the literary canon. And I know, as you mentioned earlier, that in the Hmong tradition, the, the song poet, as you talk about and write about, is typically a male who recounts the story of his people, um, their stories and tragedies, joys and losses. Um, he keeps the past alive, invokes the spirits and the homeland. And I'd like to also think of you too as a song poet of our time. So thank you so, so much again. Um, please, I put Kalia's website as well as an independent bookshop in the chat. Please, please support independent bookstores, especially during this time right now. You know, often independent bookstores um, fuel the local economy and they also, also offer a depth of experience 
and they also usually offer community outreach programs and promote literary um, um, literary writers into the world and um, celebrate the world of the written word. And so please support your local independent bookstore. Please check out Kalia's work and, um, and, and read, read her work. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us tonight. You all know where to find me if you need me. But it is such an honor to share the beginnings of my 40th year with, with, with you all tonight. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kalia, and happy birthday. Thank, thank you. you for celebrating with us. <laughs> yes, happy birthday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye -bye. Be safe and be well. <laughs>